Welcome everyone, welcome. This is the fourth and final session of the fish monitoring assessment portion of our four month long series called Emerging Technologies Information Session. My name is Jen Bayer and I'll be moderating today's webinar. In case we haven't met, I work for the USGS in the Northwest Pacific Islands Regional Office where I lead the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership or PNAP and PNAP along with the StreamNet program has co-led the planning of this webinar series. And I'd like to thank everyone in the planning group and the speakers today and all the previous speakers um, who helped put this together when we've had at least 13 people from a variety of organizations help structure this webinar series. I mentioned this is the last of our January focus on fish monitoring and assessment. Um, we're going to take a break next week, but for the remaining three weeks in February, we'll come back. We're going to focus on data management topics. Hope you join us. For that. Um, I'm joined today by one of the fellow, my fellow planning group members, Russell Scranton from Bonneville Power Administration, and his job is to introduce our excellent speakers in just a bit. First, the agenda. You can see we have two speakers. The way this is going to work, we'll do a quick icebreaker, and then Ryan Kinsering will kick it off. He'll speak for about half an hour. We'll have five minutes for questions. Then we'll hear from Dan. Another five minutes for questions for specifically for Dan, and then we should have some time left over at the end for questions for either or both, um, just to kind of uh, make sure you have that last chance to ask your question. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to offer a few tips if you're not familiar with Microsoft Teams. Um, first and foremost, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Also, cameras are really nice, but um, to focus on the speaker, we ask others to turn their camera off unless they're speaking. Maybe at the end, we could all turn them on and, and say hi to each other. You can see the toolbar for, um, there's various versions of Microsoft Teams. So look for this toolbar. The microphone, of course, is the mute. The video camera is adjacent to it. Um, the little dots, the ellipse, three, dot, three, three dots, will uh, open up a drop down that will give you other features in particular, the next slide. Uh, device settings is where you can fiddle with your audio settings. And if you're really stuck, feel free to drop a chat in the, uh, a link in the chat box, or a, a message in the chat box, and PNAM staff will try and help you out with that. Next slide, please. Um, when we do get to question and answers, uh, I'll be moderating, and there's two ways you can get our attention. You can raise your hand. That will bring your name to the top of the attendee list where we see you have a question, or you can put your uh, question into the chat in writing, and I will read them off. Um, you can do that during the presentation if you want, <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, as it comes to mind, or you can wait till that open question and answer period at the end of each talk. Next slide, please. Um, so to give you a little practice with those tips for Microsoft Teams and just for a little bit of fun, um, we're going to do some live polling using Mentimeter. So your first challenge for today is negotiate your way to the chat, which is the little uh, conversation bubble in that toolbar. You'll see a link that Amy Poles, my coworker, has dropped in there. Click on that link. If you're having trouble getting to that link, um, from the chat, you can also type in menti.com and the code 172684. So this is just for fun, but we are curious to what your interests are with respect to what sort of skills might be of use to you, things that you'd like to develop. Or so for this, this will help us understand who our audience is today and uh, spoiler alert for the end of this, we are um, hosting uh, a fish monitoring focused work group. And so this information about what your needs and interests are could help us shape the direction of that work group. And we're hoping to have a face to face conference at some point when it's safe, of course. And so understanding what topics of interest. All right, you can see the results coming in there. Thank you so much. We are going to do a little bit of live polling later in the day. So I hope that you were able to find the meeting chat and see that icebreaker. Like R might be the winner there. Great. OK. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Russell Grant. He can introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, this 
Yes, uh, I'm Russell Strand with Bonneville Power Administration. I'm a member of the um, Emerging Technology Use Information Sharing Planning Group. Um, today I'm going to, of course, kind of start off the talk with Ryan Kinzer. Uh, he's a fisheries data analysis coordinator and research scientist for the Nez Perce Nez Perce Department of Fisheries Resource Management. Ryan began his career in 2001 as a field technician for the Nez Perce Tribe with a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Resources from the University of Idaho. During his first couple of years as a field technician, he supervised, supervised crews collecting fisheries data from rotary screw traps, snorkel surveys, adult weirs, and spawning ground surveys. He later advanced to a biologist and led research projects evaluating hatchery effectiveness for the Nez Perce Tribe. During this time, Ryan recognized a need to improve his analytical skills, and he later achieved a master's degree um, in statistics from Colorado State University. Ryan currently supervises the tribe's data management efforts and coordinates fisheries data analysis for their research division projects. Good Ryan. All right. Hopefully, you guys can see me. I'm going to move that and get started. All right, so thanks for thanks for the introduction, Russell. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing kind of the streamlined data flow for improved decision making um, and really going to be focused. There we go. Really going to be focused on data collection to reporting and all the gunk in between. And and I'm going to be skipping over the actual data collection piece and really focusing on the on the part when you have the data. Okay, so that's what we're we're talking about today. I, mean, I always like to set the stage a little bit before any presentation to hopefully get the audience kind of thinking in a in a direction. Um, and these four quotes kind of do that for me. Um, and they really kind of helped us at the at the research division with the Department of Fisheries Resources Management of the Nez Perce Tribe um, really start to develop and implement our data management strategy um, that tracks data through the entire process. Okay, so I'm going to touch on each of these just briefly. I'm sure we can all agree on the first one. Bad data is a fool's investment. Um, science is hindered by the 80-20 problem which basically means that we spend 80% of our time completing the less influential tasks of our jobs and only about 20% of our time working towards our main objectives. Um, and from what I've observed throughout my career, um, this definitely seems to be true. Um, we spend a lot of our time trying to QA, QC data, manage data, um, move it around, collect it from different places, and, and only about 20% of our time actually investigating patterns in the data and learning from it. Um, the third quote that I have up on the screen is, more times than we want to admit, scientists often can't recover their own methods or data associated with their own work. Um, and I think this is extremely um, problematic. You know, It kind of goes against the entire scientific um, process to where we really want to focus and, and have some trans, um, transparency and reproducibility um, when we're actually doing our, doing our work. And then finally, um, we have a tremendous amount of ownership over the data that we collect. Um, but if it's just sitting on the shelf and not being used because we're pulled off in, in other directions, um, as we often are, we have many priorities that we're often juggling, um, you know, it's, we're not doing science any favors. Um, so putting the data out there in a place that it can actually be used to answer questions um, is good for everyone. It's good for the resources and it's good for us. So hopefully you can kind of be thinking about that as we go through the rest of the talk. Um, and this really does set the stage for why we at the Nez Perce kind of progressed the way that we did um, to start handling our data in a different way. So the goals for today um, really highlight a few data management and analysis problems that we have faced, um, illustrate how we have chosen to kind of tackle those issues, and get you thinking about your own data flow. And then selfishly, I, I want to generate discussion. I want to learn from each other. Um, and hopefully, we all end up walking away from, from my talk or Dan's talk, and we start to kind of figure out ways that, that we can do better with our data management and how we process information. 
So another Mentimeter poll just to get some audience interaction. Um, Amy is going to be dropping a, a link um, in the chat box again. Um, but before you before you answer that, I guess I want to I want to quickly run down through the answers in your multiple choice and and show you some examples of what goes on and some examples of what we've we've experienced in in our time. So which piece of data flow process is the most problematic for you? Um, in the Columbia Basin, we have fish data stored all over the place. We have raw pit tag data stored in a database called Patagus, um, coded wire tag data stored in a regional um, MARC information systems database called Armis. Um, adult weir and hatchery data is in the Lower Snake River um, compensation database FINS, genetics and fish gen, you know, I can go on. And each of these repositories often require a very intimate knowledge of how to query and use that data um, that comes out of them. Um, and without that knowledge and kind of um, experience of using that data, you often run the risk of getting incorrect data, um, getting incorrect data back or getting incorrect conclusions when you use that data. Is it preserving and protecting data? Um, in 2020, Bonneville Power Administration spent over $120 million on rm &E. Um, I pulled this figure off of the CB Fish website, um, and over half of that information was spent on data collection. And you don't have to be a mathematician to know that over the life of salmon and steelhead research in the Columbia Basin, we have spent billions of dollars collecting data. So where is it? Um, I just mentioned a few databases that we're putting data into, but that certainly doesn't cover all the data that we've collected across the basin. So if your fire or if your building were to catch fire tomorrow, you know, where where is your data at and would it be safe? What about summarizing and analyzing data? Um, just like the rest of the industries across the world in fisheries, we are now collecting big data. As an example, our staff um, are often downloading data from Patagas um, that is coming down with so many records that Excel really can't handle it efficiently anymore. Um, and people can no longer comb through each row looking for errors or to add up different groups of fish kind of by hand like they might have done 5, 10, 15 years ago. And we're even starting to use machine learning algorithms to help us understand the patterns in the data. So is this a problem that you are starting to experience and how are you going to handle it? Returning back to the 80-20 problem that I mentioned earlier, are you spending enough time investigating the questions of the day? And are you reporting your findings to improve fish management and recovery? Or do you increasingly get pulled away to less important pieces of your job? And then finally, how about getting your results noticed and actually used? Do you have trouble putting your information in front of the right people um, to support informed decision making? You know, these are all these things that we're trying to battle and we're trying to understand and we're trying to improve upon. So Amy has dropped that link and hopefully we can start to see some results come in. I'll give it a few minutes, but it's looking like querying and accessing actually is causing um, querying, accessing, summarizing and analyzing up to a lead. It's definitely an interesting problem to kind of think about. Um, we often get stuck in our own um, in our own ruts and how we do things, but these sorts of issues are just progressing and getting worse as we move forward. And as I mentioned, that we are collecting more and more data, this stuff is getting harder and harder to manage. So I may come back to this at the end of the talk um, to see if this changes, but as of right now, it looks like querying and accessing data is is kind of the winner. So a little background um, on the Nez Perce tribe and kind of our research division and, and where we're at today. The Nez Perce tribe's main area of use historically is shown here within the blue line, which is the Indian Claims Commission um, boundary. That really just kind of depicts uh, an area that was primarily used by the Nez Perce tribe. Um, it doesn't mean that, that the tribal members didn't go outside of that boundary. Um, and you can see that it overlays almost completely on the Snake River Basin. Um, the Snake River Basin is shown in gray. 
And it's because of this kind of historical use that the Nez Perce tribe today is really focused on managing um, and working together with our co-managers to collaboratively kind of monitor and track these populations. Um, we have four offices across the basin. The Sweetwater office, which is near Lewiston, Idaho, um, is really kind of our admin office. The Orfino office is up in the northern kind of part for the Clearwater region. Um, the McCall, Idaho office is down here next to the South Fork Salmon. And then Northeast Oregon um, is in Joseph, in Joseph, Oregon. They kind of manage the Northeast Oregon portion of the basin. Um, across those four offices, we have nine RM&E projects, and they primarily are focused on the same thing, um, hatchery program evaluations and status and trends monitoring. And with those objectives, they are using largely the same data sets. Um, so the dots that you're seeing on the map are really just different pieces of data that these projects are collecting and where. And you can see they're spread out pretty thoroughly across the entire basin. And you see the same colors all over the place, which just de depicts the same information being collected. However, these, pop or these pop um, projects are really independently focused. And they were set up that way from the beginning. Um, they came on at different times, um, started at different times, and they have their you know, little tweaks on their objectives that they're trying to, to achieve. Um, so they kind of are thinking kind of in a box or have been. So as you can imagine, this creates some problems. Um, because of this independent nature, um, we began seeing across these projects, these problems starting to crop up. Simple things at first, um, slightly different data collecting protocols, um, which might lead you to slightly different answers when you analyze that data. Um, different names for particular metrics. Um, one group using sex ratio and another group using um, female proportion as an example. Um, and at times, even metrics being calculated differently and with different data sets. Um, a few major problems, too many spreadsheets. Uh, each project had their own spreadsheets for raw data, um, another spreadsheet for making their calculations. Um, often there was another different spreadsheets for different years um, and even different spreadsheets within a project um, because every staff member had their own. Um, so I'm sure most people on the call has seen some sort of scenario like this where you have multiple Excel files and you really don't know which one's which. And you get to this point where you just throw your hands up in the air and you don't know what to do. Okay. Our next major problem was really being unsure if calculated fish metrics across our various projects and, and those that we were using to manage fish and to make adaptive management recommendations were actually apples to apples comparisons, um, or if the differences we observed across programs were due to some underlying methodology or data type difference. Um, and to be honest, because of that independent nature of our projects in the beginning, um, that was really kind of a less of a concern to us. Um, all of our projects were focused on their own goals and objectives, and um, they were doing that in the best way possible to answer those questions. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, almost recently that we started to get kind of nervous about this and the fact that we started being asked to supply a lot of these metrics and high level high level indicators to regional databases that had the sole purpose of comparing metrics across programs, across agencies, across the region. And it was then that we kind of started getting nervous and started thinking about how do we how do we make sure that this information can be interpreted correctly? Um, this slide is a, is almost a duplicate of the spreadsheet slide, but it does touch on something slightly different, and it's preserving and protecting data. Um, our historical data was extremely expensive to collect, and we have it spread across multiple dig digital mediums that are getting increasingly hard to recover um, if necessary. Um, and I'm going to date myself a little bit and say that, you know, I have ha actually pulled data from all of these places and, and have used it in different analyses, but I, it would be impossible for me to do that today. Um, I don't think in our office 
um, we even have any of this equipment to pull data off of these devices if necessary. So, so we started thinking proactively on how we could move data into a storage repository that could actually be protected for, for going forward. And whether we want to admit it or not, those types of problems will put you into this type of a situation, um, which none of us really want. So what did we do? So some time ago, we saw all this coming down the pipeline and we started thinking about um, the best way to move forward. Um, and we thought up a simple solution that really entails these four pieces um, where data collection efforts needed to be kind of standardized and consistent across our groups. Um, the data would need to be stored in a single location um, that would be similar across all of our projects. Um, at times, we would use external data to, to get us to our answers that we needed, that potentially our co-managers were collecting. Um, and we would process all that information using automated scripts. Um, and really, it's that kind of that thought that allows us to ensure that our data queries are the same and we get the same result back every time and that our calculations are being done um, in a similar fashion across the landscape. Okay. Each part of this idea and the data flow strategy is governed by our staff and by what we have coined as technical teams, um, where each project has a representative to make sure that items progress in a way that meet their needs Yet we focus on finding consistencies across programs um, and together we document each data collection protocol. So you're seeing kind of on this on the left hand side of the screen um, a metadata repository called monitoring resources that we're supplying data collection protocols to and on the right hand part of the screen a, a document that we are drafting and trying to put um, final and will eventually move into monitoring resources that contains all of our standardized kind of calculations. And today the, the system kind of looks like this, so it's a little more involved. Um, our staff collect data either on paper data sheets or using electronic tablets. Um, that data moves into our internal database, which is called CDMS or Centralized Data Management System. Um, sometimes the data goes to an external repository like FINS or Armis or Patagas. Um, and we have built four different R packages to actually process this information. So CDMS R is pulling and pushing data to CDMS. Um, a package named Fisher is pulling data from external sources. CM in the middle is NESPERS for fish. And that's really our summary and kind of analysis engine that has all of the calculations and, and methods within it. And then Coos is an R Shiny application that is really constructed to share that information um, with our staff and, and our tribal members and our managers and, and the general public. Okay. So I want to jump into an example of how all this works. So I'm going to talk about natural origin spawner abundance here. And for the purposes of this presentation, um, I've kind of uh, I'm going to do a fairly a simple approach at this. Um, we're going to calculate it using an adult weir escapement. We're going to use proportion of hatchery origin spawners to adjust it, adjust it to natural origin fish only. And we're going to back out some pre spawn mortality fish. Okay. And again, this isn't necessarily how we do this. Um, um, for our typical reporting process, which includes a, a natural origin spawner abundance for the entire population. These, this sort of calculation is really just looking at spawner abundance upstream of the weir, um, just for illustrative purposes. So the data comes from spawning ground surveys. In 2020, we actually used electronic um, data capture for the first time. Um, we used a, a Esri product called Survey123 to create our forms. Um, Samantha Smith actually gave a presentation on this on January 7th to this group. Um, that presentation was filmed, so if you're interested in how we did that and what those tablet forms look like, um, please go see her talk. It was recorded, um, and she gave that talk with a number of other folks. Um, from different agencies, and it was really great information. 
that data gets collected and then it once the tablet comes back to the office it um, links up with the Wi-Fi connection and automatically gets transferred into our centralized data management system, um, our online kind of repository. Um, the other pieces of the puzzle to calculate NOSA and particularly the escapement estimate is the adult weir data. Um, so our adult weir operations collect data in the field using the offline version of FINS and similar process. When those computers come back, they upload to the FINS um, online database. Okay. So to show how this works, um, we're going to walk through kind of the different R packages on how they pull and push data around. Um, so the first one we're going to do is we're going to download our carcass data. Um, so we're going to use the CDMS R package. You can see some little bit of R code on the left, but you don't need to know it to follow the rest of the talk. Um, so don't be scared. Um, I'm loading the package and I'm also loading tidyverse because it's a wonderful way to process data. And the first thing I got to do is log in to CDMS. CDMS is a restricted access database, so it's only available to our internal users. Um, and I can run the git data store command to quickly see what type of data is in the database. So what you're seeing in the output is different data tables. And what I'm particularly interested in is the carcass data in ID number 79. And I can feed that number 79 into my next function, which says get data set view, and I can pull down carcass data. And if you have any experience with um, carcass data, it looks very similar to this, um, where we have carcass species and marks and tag information, and sex and length and all that good stuff. Um, the package CM actually kind of cleans the data a little bit. Um, it performs a little bit of QA, QC, and creates some value added fields um, that are just really kind of there to help us group and sort the, sort the data. Those happen to be kind of above weir, above pit array, above RST. Um, and one other value added field that is really important is origin. Um, origin is important as we start to, to determine our PHOS numbers and our pre-spawn mortality numbers when they go into that. Um, and it's developed from CM and CM uses, oops, excuse me, CM uses the marks and tag information in the carcass data to determine it. Okay. The next package, Fisher, is actually phishing data from the FINS database. So you can see that first highlighted code chunk it says get FINS data on the left. Um, I'm interested in trapping module data from FINS. Um, I'm looking for NPT data and I set some start and end dates and I can pull that data directly into the R environment for further processing. Um, I use a similar function called clean weir data and I now have a data set that's ready to be processed and it's ready to be kind of married up with carcass data. And if you use FINS, you probably recognize these names. This pretty much is a mirror copy of what comes straight out of the FINS database. I can take those two data sets and feed them into my next CM function to generate mark recapture estimates. Um, what is going on behind the scenes is it's basically searching for our marks released from a weir, um, and it's searching for our carcasses that were recovered, and it's searching for the number of carcasses that were actually recaptures that showed the initial mark from the weir, and then processing it using that adjusted Lincoln-Peterson formula that I showed on a previous slide. Um, and what you see is it is doing this real time as I pull the data in. It's doing it for every trap that has weird data, and it's doing it for every year. Um, and you have the escapement estimates here under the column N. Um, but you can sort through here and see all these different years. You can see we have 2020 Johnson Creek in there, um, and then it just starts to transition over to Lolo Creek, so the next the next data set. So this is a really efficient way to not only get data and to get data in a standard kind of consistent fashion, but also to process it and crank out an escapement estimate really efficiently. We can then use that carcass data to develop our PHOS estimates, um, a little bit of sorting and filtering to get the fish that I want. 
Um, and then the highlighted chunk is a CM function that is creating a proportional estimate of hatchery. Um, and I'm getting the confidence intervals that come out that typically have not been available. Um, estimating variance at times for a number of these metrics that we are interested in can be a little bit tricky and is not always in the skill set of our biologists. So by using these sorts of packages, we can actually program that stuff so that those estimators, um, variance estimators get kicked out appropriately each time. And then you can also propagate those forward to all your future um, metrics that you're calculating. Pre-spawn mortality is calculated very similarly. Um, looking, just changing out my summary variable and what I want to calculate um, is spawned out now. And I can get those numbers. You're not, not, you're not on Ryan Kinzer's. By quickly joining those data sets together, um, I can join my mark recaptures, my pre-spawn mortalities, and my PHOS numbers, and I can run it through my very simple equation to calculate NOSA. And now I have NOSA for my above weir population in Johnson Creek. Um, and actually behind the scenes, I have it for all of our other systems also. I'm just displaying Johnson Creek at this time. Now, as I mentioned, natural origin spawner abundance is a little trickier to calculate. Um, when we typically report this, we are reporting it for the population, and that requires information downstream of the weirs, which we get with reds. So on this slide, instead of walking through it, um, I'm just quickly showing you kind of the results and how I get there. Uh, I needed to download the red data. So I download red data from CDMS again, I clean it with those functions and I supply red data, carcass data, and my mark recapture estimates to my get NOSA function. And now I have NOSA IJ, which is including JAX um, for the entire East Fork, South Fork population, which Johnson Creek is a part of um, in really quick, easy steps. So the next part of the puzzle is showing you Coos and how Coos actually functions. So Coos is loading up now. And Coos is an R shiny application. Um, we wrote this to actually access CDMS. So it's using CDMS R behind the scenes. Um, it is using Fisher behind the scenes to pull in external data and it's using CM behind the scenes to process that data. So you should be seeing the screen now. When it opens up, there's a little data use agreement. You can quickly see that it's pulling in some window count data. This information is important to our staff, but also our tribal members. So um, we really haven't started seeing any 2021 fish, so it's still looking at 2020. Um, there's some spawning ground summaries in here. So showing you just Big Creek kind of red counts. We can look at Johnson Creek or the East Fork Reds that we were just showing um, for our NOSA estimates. Very quick displays of different metrics and tabular data. Um, we have spawner abundance actually being displayed on here also. So what we were just calculating, we have spawner abundance in here. And the reality is, is we have multiple ways of calculating spawner abundance. So there's a couple different methods that you can choose, different species, um, and different water bodies that you may be interested in. And again, quick little plots and some tabular data. The last thing I'm going to show for Coos is there's a little added functionality um, for restricted access users or people that are kind of internal. Um, and once you actually sign in, um, you have access to our CDMS data sets, just like you saw us doing earlier in the slideshow. Um, there's some custom queries in here for doing various, um, various things, summarizing reds or spawning ground data or um, juvenile trapping data. You can access fins. Um, and we have this functionality built into here is because not all of our staff are um, our users. So we wanted to actually give them the power of using R without knowing it. 
So we created those packages and we have them intertwined in here so that when they need a particular query or that when they need a particular output, you know, we can we can generate that here, put it under our custom queries or um, allow access through their data sets and they can get that same kind of data out um, and using the power of R. The last step I'm going to look at is we also use this um, entire package to generate templates for annual reports. So I'm downloading a template right now. Um, what it's doing is actually querying the database and populating a, a Word document. And when it comes down, which my earlier testing, Amy, I didn't have any problems with it happening. So let's hope it still goes that way. <laughs> Ryan, this is Jed. I am nervous about old time. We want to have time for questions. So. You bet. I'll keep cruising and when it pops up, I can show you. Okay. So last, um, another audience interaction quick. Which part of your research project takes the most time to complete? So Amy is going to drop that link in the chat box um, and we'll see the results soon. Um, is it project administration and process? Is it budgeting and contracting? Data management? Data analysis and hypothesis testing? or is it sharing information and publishing? Um, so similar topic or question as before, but really kind of focusing on that 80-20 issue. Like where do you spend the most time and is that where you want to be spending it and is that most effective? So while you're answering that, I'll just jump into closing. Uh, data management is a work in progress. Um, we have been working at this for a long time and been thinking about it and we are far from perfect. Um, 2020 was our first year of implementation. Um, we developed our collaborative reports in those templates, um, which hopefully you can see in a second. Um, but we really focused on development and it, that required a lot of compromises and concessions. Um, I don't think anybody was you know, perfectly happy with everything that went in the first version of those reports. Um, however, you know, we really wanted to just get it kind of out the door and get the process running. Um, so currently in 2021, we're reviewing and documenting methods um, and improving those, you know, finding missing parts and fixing them and improving the workflow. Um, so results from the last one is data management. Which part of your research project takes the most time to complete? And that is not surprising to me that most people spend their time trying to manage their data. So. That's exactly why we were trying to focus on this flow and trying to figure out the best way to find efficiencies for our staff so that they no longer had to worry about the data management, that that would just come into their fingertips and they could then begin to start focusing on the data analysis and hypothesis testing and sharing that information with the, with the right people to you know, make some change. So with that, um, I want to say thank you to a, a number of people and and primarily you know without R this wouldn't be possible without all the packages that have been contributed by the many people um, that that create those things um, they're all open source and it really has allowed us to kind of implement this whole data flow and then of course our CDMS database wasn't developed by us it was developed by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatill Indian Reservation and your next ETIS sec session on February 7th, Stacy Schumacher is going to be focusing on CDMS. Um, so go there and listen to her if you want to hear all the gory details. Um, Thanks, Ryan. I think it might be February 11th, but that's okay. We'll come 11th? back around to that. <laughs> so I want to thank Ryan for an excellent talk and boy, so much progress. That was amazing. Um, we can see the report. I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, Ryan's displaying the report that he showed how they automated it out. That's that. I'm sure that's a really good resource for people tasked with report writing. We have a few minutes for questions. You can raise your hand or type it in the chat. We'll also have some time at the end after our next speaker. And thank you, Clark. I see you already answered one of the questions. That's great. Anybody? Sorry to rush you at the end there, Ryan. I was getting nervous. No problem. I, I knew it was there. going to be down to the wire. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you wait, couldn't I tell, I, I was kind of, I was talking fast. 
a lot to do. Thank you for put, fitting it all in there. Kevin is asking, did you have any difficult decisions to make around built-in estimators in the CM package? Yes, and honestly, that those conversations are still going on. Um, you know, through those technical teams that I mentioned earlier that are really guiding that. Um, the CM package, you know, we we started that as kind of a draft, and we are always circling back and reevaluating methods and estimators, um, trying to follow the best available science. You know, they may change as, as science evolves and new methods come available. Um, so absolutely, that they that is a usually a big source of our conversation during the technical team meetings. Any other questions? Well, keep in mind that if you're 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 not able to get to the chat right now, but you or your question occurs to you in a minute, um, we will have some time after we hear from Dan Isaac here in a second. And um, we will also these webinars are recorded. You can find it later, and we'll have we'll be able to uh, connect with Ryan. All right, Russell, are you out there? I am. Thank you, Jen. All right. Um, I'm going to kick you, off Ryan. the. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, really appreciate the talk. And we're going to do the introduction for Dan Isaac. Uh, Dan is a fisheries research scientist with the United States Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station, where he works on cold water fish conservation and management issues in the Western U.S. His research focuses on understanding the effects of climate change, environmental gradients, and natural disturbances on stream river habitats and fish communities, stream temperature and species distribution, monitoring and modeling, development and implementation of geostatistical models for data on stream networks, and use of crowdsourcing to build large open access interagency databases and websites that help connect people, information, and landscapes. Take it away, Dan. Okay. Let's see. Amy, were, were you going to pull up a... Um... Poll. I forget if we're doing that at the beginning or at the end. Yeah, I'll drop that first link into the chat and pull up the, the results slide. Yeah, and I think I think the initial question here was just to get a sense of you know what what are the different software packages maybe that people are using um, to organize and, and track some of their um, fish density survey information. So you know, I'm sure these can be span the whole spectrum from being you know fairly advanced through a, a system of interrelated um, programs like Ryan just talked about to something you know that that's really simple and you know done entirely within Excel but just curious what what that sort of diversity was that's that's out there ah yeah so it looks like um, still a fairly large proportion of people are using you know just a straightforward spreadsheet um, Access is probably the, the most popular then real database or relational database that people are feeding this information into. So um, uh, that's, that's good to know. And, and, you know, in theory, then, as long as those Excel spreadsheets are standardized in, in their formats, those can be readily integrated into something like a relational database and the sort of workflow that um, Ryan covered so nicely in his presentation. So. I don't. I go ahead then um, and take control of the screen again, Amy, and, and go ahead with uh, the slides. Sounds good, Dan. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, and so I just wanted to build on um, kind of you know some of the information that Ryan covered in his talk in terms of you know data flows and having efficient systems for um, managing the information that we're collecting, and and specifically here I'm I'm going to focus on fish density surveys. So electrofishing, snorkeling sorts of things, but you know, basically the, the, the system that I'm gonna cover today can be applied to you know, any sort of data that, that we're commonly collecting on stream networks, whether those are water quality parameters or eDNA surveys or habitat surveys, et cetera. You know, all that stuff is just gonna be a database. It's all gonna be linked to a stream network. And so we have a need to develop efficient tools for you know, not only managing that information, but then once it's in a, in a good, um, consistent uh, data format, doing things with it to 
you know, fit models and use models to then to generate inference about the habitat covariates that might be affecting a biological outcome, and also potentially, you know, interpolating among observations, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, today I want to go through what we call the FISH data analysis tool and, and applying spatial stream network models with these standardized databases that are becoming more common to provide um, information for decision makers. And this is work that is funded by the Bonneville Power Administration, but it really builds on, um, you know, kind of work and, and research that we've been doing um, with, with my collaborators here, Aaron Peterson and Jay Verhoof, for, for more than a decade now on these spatial stream network models. Um, and, and there's kind of this end piece now of taking that foundation, that analytical foundation, and rolling it over into some of these larger, um, more common types of data than is, is kind of you know, work that we're starting to move into with uh, BPA's help. Um, and so, you know, just a little bit of background, um, you know, we're all aware of how much time and, and effort um, we individually or the agencies that we work for invest in um, monitoring biological resources and, and, you know, the standard sorts of surveys that, that people do in the Northwest and other parts of the country you know, typically consist of um, Electrofishing surveys, maybe red counts, um, snorkeling surveys, eDNA is becoming more and more common. And so there are literally thousands of sites um, where we've got recorded information about the density of a target organism out there on the stream network somewhere. Um, you know, those maps in the bottom left of that are just showing examples of some data sets from ODFNW or um, from Idaho, Montana, or Interior Columbia. And despite then how um, common and relatively abundant these sorts of um, uh, surveys are, you know, they still, want, once you overlay the, those point measurements on the full extent of river and stream networks, they, they do literally represent just a drop in the bucket in terms of, um, you know, the hundreds of thousands of linear kilometers that these networks typically encompass. So it's nice to be able to have um, the ability to interpolate among those measurement locations um, and make predictions throughout that full stream network or you know subsets of it that we might be interested in um, knowing more about um, because that gives us a nice status assessment for one particular point in time and then if we stack you know different um, surveys on top of one another through time we we can also infer um, you know something about trends in that particular thing that we're measuring and so one of the challenges with, with working with these um, large data sets, especially once you start pulling this information together from different databases that different agencies might be maintaining, is that um, inevitably there's, there's kind of no real um, you know, formal sampling design that went into these because you're, you're combining data from, from multiple studies. And so you know you you end up with a lot of non-randomness in, in these data sets, a lot of spatial clustering, spatial gaps, et cetera. And so to make inference from or apply models to those sorts of data sets, you really need to have something that can account for the spatial structure of the observations on the stream networks. And so this is the work that Aaron and Jay have done, um, you know, beginning all the way back in 2006 to develop, you know, a specific type of spatial autoregressive model for um, data on stream networks that accounts for that spatial structure and, and non-randomness in these sort of aggregated data sets, but also accounts for um, network topology and the, um, you know, tributary confluences, the direction of flow, all those sorts of things uh, need to be accounted for um, if ultimately you're going to model these data sets um, in a way that that's realistic um, for for stream networks. And so they've done a lot of work, you know, even even before I started working with them to develop the statistical theory and, and R packages for for running um, these sorts of models. Um, but to see how well they would they would actually work for um, fish density surveys, we did a pilot study several years ago where we just used the SSN models with a small electrofishing data set that we had from a river basin on the border between Wyoming and Idaho. Through about 100 observations um, in that data set and that map there on the left shows those point observations and those are just color coded then by the density of trout um, that were um, estimated to occur at, at each of those 100 or so sites. The map on the right then is the um, SSN model fit to those and then used to interpolate and make a series of continuous predictions along the stream network 
um, so that you can get a continuous map of densities um, for that particular network. Um, and another you know, really interesting and useful thing uh, about these models is that um, because they are um, spatial auto aggressive in nature, they, they understand um, kind of the spatial juxtaposition of measurements on stream networks. And when you are close to a point where you've got a measurement, then um, predictions from the model are highly confident um, because you, you're right next to a place where you've already observed something. When you are farther away in space from some place where you've got an observation, then the model, as you would you would expect just, just by common sense, that the model should be less confident in, in the predictions that it's making. And it can reflect that um, in terms of width of, of the confidence intervals. And so kind of that inset on um, that map panel to the right that shows a blow up, you can kind of see the, the width of the black line. That, that's actually the um, prediction errors or the standard errors of the predictions. And, and you can you can see that reflected. It, it's the model's a lot more confident in some areas and not as confident in other areas. And the other nice thing then that these models do is that they generally do have you know a lot higher predictive accuracy than models that aren't accounting for um, spatial structure in the data set and, and the topology of the network itself. And so here the scatter plot on the left is just showing you know, what the results would be for this data set if we applied a standard linear regression model to it versus the SSN model on the right. And we're, we're seeing a big boost. And then this is pretty typical of what we see in, in these sorts of data sets when we've applied them um, in, in many different places and circumstances. So now that we've got you know a, a nice set of, of software and statistical theory that, that works well with, with these sorts of uh, data sets that are becoming increasingly common um, in, in the Northwest and, and other parts of the country, to really um, be able to apply those in kind of a general fashion, you need to also have um, a standardized data set or database that represents the, the network that, that you're going to work with. And, and this um, need was filled nicely by a lot of the work that uh, EPA and USGS did um, over the last decade or so to build the NHD plus um, national stream hydrography layer. And, and this is great because it just provides a consistent blue line vector representation of all the reaches of all the rivers and streams anywhere in the country and does it consistently. And the other nice thing about this um, NHD uh, plus data set is that each of those reaches then within um, that network has a consistent set of descriptors associated with it. And it's done in, again, a consistent way anywhere in, in the country. So you've got elevation estimates, slope estimates, land use, precipitation, et cetera, et cetera. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of these um, reach descriptors that are um, additional data sets that work um, seamlessly with, with this NHD plus data set. Um, and, and those citations at the bottom are just a couple examples of those that provide um, a whole suite of, of these cohorts. And those are nice because those can be used as predictor variables then in these SSN models to try to understand the spatial patterns that, that you're seeing in um, fish density surveys. The, the challenge to doing all this, though, is that there are a lot of moving parts that are involved, and, and it's, it really is, or has been at least, kind of a tedious um, labor um, consuming process to link together all these different data sets um, and, and create the um, supplemental data files that the SSN models need to understand the uh, spatial juxtaposition of points on the network. And so, you know, that's where within our own lab, we've kind of developed that expertise and we can make this work, but it, it's really hard for others um, without a, a whole team of people with all the technical skills that they need to have to be able to um, run these models. And so that kind of led, you know, through discussions with, with Russell and, and um, others at BPA about the need to um, try to automate some of that process. And, and that's kind of what, what we're trying to do then with this FDAT tool. And so, so the idea here is to have a end user enabled um, web based tool that can automate um, data uploading, editing, and then the, the model fitting uh, of these SSNs um, and then output predictions um, on the stream network and have that done in, in geospatial formats so that people can download the information um, and use it with other geospatial data sets or they can just view the results in a way that's kind of interactive and intuitive and allows them to explore the data sets um, more efficiently. 
And so um, we've we've taken this as far as kind of a pilot project um, application so far. This is this is just a flowchart of the different um, parts in, in that pilot project. Um, place that we, we've done this work initially is the Grand Ronde River Basin. Um, so this is in um, northeast Oregon. And, and the tool that we've um, developed so far, this is just a, a little screen capture from it. It allows the user to go into it and upload a set of spatially referenced uh, fish density survey locations. And then um, you, you can view those those sites interactively, zoom in on those. Um, you know the coordinates that you feed into it are going to you know, put that point survey um, at a place in space. And, and if uh, those surveys aren't showing up on the stream network, then the tool allows um, the user to edit the location and drag them over to the proper um, location on the stream network. And then snap the points so that um, you know that network topology begins to be established in a way that properly represents you know what's going on in the real world. And, and once that's done, um, you, know, you can make you know, basic summaries from from the information just just to do some QA QC checks on it and make sure everything got you know fed into the system properly. And so after that initial step, then um, you know where, where the users upload the information, checked it. Then there's there's going to be a bunch of things that get done behind the scenes, um, and, and this is the part then that we're really trying to automate. Um, you know, I won't go into detail on all the steps that are that are involved here, but um, for those that that are familiar with uh, these SSN models, and you know, some some folks may have may have actually come to the the three day training workshops that we do to learn how to run these models. Essentially, what what's going to go on behind the scenes here is all the stuff you know that you learn over the course of that that three day workshop in terms of you know how the points get um, tied to the network, how the stars software that Aaron has developed checks those points and checks the network topology and 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 the flow characteristics of that network, and then calculation of some of the um, distance matrix files and other supplemental files that the SSN package needs to um, fit these models in R. Um, all that information or all that those steps are going to be done kind of behind the scenes here so that you know the end user as once they've um, uploaded their information and they hit go um, all that's going to happen and the model um, fitting process is, is going to um, occur within within a matter of minutes and they'll quickly then be able to visualize um, outputs from the model. And that's that's what this slide is representing then is just um, you know making a set of predictions about um, the densities of juvenile Chinook on the Grand Ronde River network. A little bit hard to see here that the color coding is not especially good, but it goes from um, light pink colors are, are where high densities of juvenile Chinook are predicted to occur, and then dark purple colors are our low densities of, of juvenile Chinook. The other thing um, that that's nice about these SSN models, and I guess I, I mentioned that in the previous slide for, from the pilot study that, that we initially did, is that the predictions from the model get weighted you know, by the, the uh, um, amount of spatial uncertainty there is, so that when you are close to a place where you, you fed in observation information, then your confidence interval are tighter, the model's more um, um, more confident uh, of what the predictions are, the further away you get, the less certain you are. And so immediately you, you can think then about the potential applications of that sort of information for um, revising and implementing um, new monitoring designs, right? So, so if you wanted to try to reduce the overall uncertainty across the river basin, that information would allow you maybe to target places where you have the greatest uncertainty showing up. And then you would feed that um, new, new data into, into the model and you would reduce your overall uncertainty for um, fish density within that particular um, river basin. You can also do um, some things like um, summarize, making predictions across the full network and then summarizing um, what the average predictions are within particular sub-basins. So if you wanted to derive a, a larger scale population estimate than, than typically the reach scale population estimates that, that we're doing, um, you can do that sort of um, thing within the tool that's actually a spatial statistical process that's called block creeding. Um, and um, so for each of these different 
sub-basins or, or hucks within the Grand Ronde River Basin, the model here is deriving those block creeged population estimates. Um, again, it's a little bit hard to see on, on that um, table there, but for the different years then, it's actually deriving, you know, or estimating that in some cases you've got 30,000 juvenile Chinook in a particular huck, and in other places, you know, lower abundance years, maybe as few as uh, 5,000 uh, juvenile Chinook in, in some of those basins. So, so that's kind of the pilot. That that uh, is something that we we've we've made work, um, but it's not publicly accessible yet. And, and to take it that next step and, and make it really a kind of an operational system that um, folks within uh, the Northwest can use, there are still some some additional things that we have to work through. One of which is developing an agreed upon data exchange standard so that end users can upload their information um, and then share their their um, annual juvenile density surveys with with um, anyone else that, that's plugged into that database. And so, you know, by now people are getting more and more familiar with this. They're kind of used to having the, these standardized tools that you upload data, um, but essentially there'd be a, a set of fields here that um, are gonna make sure that the end user inputs the data um, that, that's required in, in specific formats. The other thing um, that, that we have to do and that, that we're working on um, finalizing is developing um, really robust spatial data processing software. So, you know, all these steps that kind of go on behind the scenes once the information has been uploaded into the tool. Um, historically, we've done that using ArcGIS, but the problem with that is every time Arc is releasing um, a new update or, or a new version of the software, then, then we've got to change a bunch of the other um, software that, that plugs into that. And so Erin's been working with some of her collaborators to, to develop this OS stars um, package for R, where a lot of the functionality and things that we've been relying on ArcGIS for uh, in the past, hopefully we can migrate that over into more of an open source environment in R. And then the third um, major hurdle that we need to overcome to kind of implement this um, more broadly is to develop or well to basically make the SSN model fitting process more computationally efficient. Um, we'll read through all this here, but you know essentially we're, we're going to be dealing with um, data sets if this gets scaled up to something the size of the Columbia River Basin that are going to have thousands and thousands of fish density surveys and Based on applying <clears throat> these models to data sets of that side in the past, um, you know, even running on, on fast workstations, um, we'll, we'll set up an SSN model run and it'll take several days to get just a single model fit for, for these large data sets. And so that obviously is going to put a damper on, um, you know, getting any sort of uh, real-time feedback from uploading information to an FDAT tool fitting a model and getting results back. And so Jay's been working um, on developing statistical theory that can improve the computational efficiency of these data sets. Um, and, and that's actually pretty far along such that um, we, we think we, we've basically got the, these models sped up now from um, what they used to take um, running to be about a hundred times faster now than they were. So almost a two order of magnitude um, increase in computational efficiency. And I'll show what that, that looks like here in, in a subsequent slide. So, so the potential advantages then of, of creating and implementing the, the, you know, a fully functional FDAT system would be that um, we could have a centralized and publicly accessible data repository for um, fish density um, surveys across, across the Columbia River Basin, or people are interested in, in this sort of system in other parts of the country. It can be done anywhere, you know, again, because we've got these standardized stream networks and covariates um, and, and software. So you can really stand this, this sort of thing up anywhere anywhere in the country. Um, it can remove a lot of technical barriers um, because a lot of the um, you know, detailed and time consuming uh, spatial data processing steps will be automated. Um, and then predictive model outputs can be used to generate information about status and potentially trend information across full river networks or, or subsets of them. And then, you know, doing all this is complex enough. You know, you've, you've got to actually be really documenting all your steps as you go along. And so obviously you would have a set of replicable, um, well-defined um, and interlinked series of protocols that go together to kind of describe how this is all done. And then 
you know, as I mentioned before at the beginning of the talk, you know, this, this analytical architecture, um, you know, the initial application here might be for fish um, density data sets because those are really high value um, data sets and they're common, but this architecture um, potentially can be modified to work with, you know, water quality uh, measurements or, or eDNA or, or whatever it is that, that people are interested in and are collecting data on um, for stream networks. Um, and so, Second half of the talk, I just wanted to kind of you know, quickly run through a larger scale example of um, applying the SSN models and potentially then what we could you know, get to the point of, of really automating and, and making um, a, a nice resource for, for people within the um, Pacific Northwest. And so in, in this part of the work um, started oh, a couple of years ago, we essentially wanted to pull together you know, a large interagency uh, data set um, that has spanned a much larger area than, than the Grand Ronde River Basin. And so we worked in the John Day Basin, the Grand Ronde River Basin of Northeast Oregon, and then the Clearwater and, and Salmon River Basins of, of Idaho. And you know, contacted and, and worked with um, partners, ODFNW, um, Idaho Fish and Game, Biomark, Forest Service had a bunch of data, pulled all that information um, together from, from all the people that had it and all the databases where it had uh, resided to create one kind of uh, unified um, data set. Um, so that for juvenile Chinook salmon, for steelhead, you know, we basically had around uh, 7,000 or so observations for, for both of these species. Um, and here we're just visualizing um, what those look like through a couple um, you know, maps that were generated in, in ArcGIS. Um, so you can see the, the locations of those thousands of sites within the study area. And they're color coded then just by the um, you know, density of, of fish per 100 meters of stream. So you get an index of relative abundance by looking at those. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we um, also ran into um, having to spend some time on that that um, would be something anywhere that we apply this we would have, kind of have to go through the same step it, it is really refining and getting um, the stream networks um, delineated so that they represent the um, universe of potential habitat for a particular species um, and so in the pacific northwest we had the um, fish data layers from the stream net um, database to rely on and, and for the most part you know th those um, were, were pretty reliable those have been you know built over the years by a lot of input from um, local biologists but we, we did see some instances where the, the stream net coverages weren't um, 100 percent encompassing all the observations that we're seeing within these aggregated data sets and so we, we did have to spend a little bit of time kind of modifying and adding um, some additional um, reaches into these networks before we could kind of call them um, as being fully representative of potential habitat networks and going to the modeling stage. Um, and then, you know, that there's a lot of different covariates that, that are available now. Um, the, these are just some of the ones that we pulled together that, that seem to you know, potentially have some biological relevance for these two species, um, you know, from the, those stream cat data sets and, and other places um, that these are, these are available. And then, you know, fitting the SSN models to these, um, you know, two fish species, that this, these are the basic predictive results that we got, you know, and it's not awesome, but but at the same time, it's it's pretty good for, for what um, I was anticipating we would see for, for these two data sets. You know, it's, they're huge data sets. These are data that are collected by, you know, different protocols. So we've got electrofishing data in here. We've got um, snorkeling data in here. Um, sometimes we've got just a, a one pass estimate uh, to calculate densities from. Other times people have done, you know, a multiple pass depletion estimate. So th there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of noise just just um, in, in the data that were um, we were able to pull together for this. So the fact that we can account for, you know, half the variance in that um, actually is pretty good. And it, it's comparable, too, to what we saw in, in that earlier pilot project that we did with the um, electrofishing trout um, data set. So this was this was kind of encouraging. Um, and, and then I guess building on what I, what I mentioned earlier about the computational efficiency of, of the SSN models, when we, we first fit these models, um, I think we were working with a Chinook data set. We didn't quite have uh, that, that big data package ready to go yet. So we were fitting the, those 6,700 observations using the old SSN package. 
And it was taking literally um, six days of computation time to get one model fit to be able to, you know, est or, or link the covariates to these things and have have the best estimates. Um, by the time we'd worked our way over to um, the steelhead data set, Jay had, had finished, um, you know, the, the statistical routines in R for the SSN big data package and working with a, a slightly larger data set of 7,400 observations, we could then fit that SSN model to those data. And it took only about 10 minutes to get a model fit and um, similar predictive performance um, with that and in covariate estimates, of course. So big step forward there in terms of uh, being able to operationalize this at large scales with big data sets going forward. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that, that you get out of the SSN models, just like any other linear model, is that you're going to get parameter estimates for covariates, and you can use those then to create um, response curves, describing the relationship between different habitat or biological factors that affect um, the organism that, that you're focused on and, and the abundance of that. And so you know, these are just the response curves for steelhead, response curves um, for Chinook, won't spend a lot of time on those, but that's basically the underlying um, model set of model relationships that um, has been estimated by the SSN. And once you've got that and you've got the quantitative estimates of the parameters that define those curves, you can use that with the stream network and all the covariates that are available for each reach in that network to map out in a spatially continuous fashion what the densities are of, in this case, Chinook salmon. And so we've gone from a series of point observations um, at, you know, several thousand sites to being able to now make inference about those, what's going on at those points and use that to make us, you know, this continuous map so that we can represent, you know, throughout the full 9,000 kilometers of um, streams and rivers that Chinook um, potentially have access to within the study area, what the high density zones are and what the low density zones are. So it gives just a nice continuous picture and, and a good resource for a manager to really try to understand um, spatial variance in, in this um, in this fish. And once you can do that, so so that you know basically gives us a standardized representation of status uh, of this uh, of Chinook for this particular period, which is just the average across uh, 18 years or so of data that we had here. That then becomes a tool, say that a decision maker um, can use to to um, you know allocate resources for conservation. And so one of the ways that uh, Russell and BPA have been using this is to visualize. Um, that SSN um, density information for um, these species in their one fish, two fish web tools. And you know, those, those densities then are represented in that bottom right map. The, uh, some of the other um, uh, spatial data sets that they use there uh, are represented in the upper left map. And so that upper left map is showing the intrinsic potential of habitat for uh, Chinook. And so, you know, if you want to think about you know, where might we make um, restoration investments, you know, maybe the habitat is really good in one place, but the, the observed densities are really low and you immediately can kind of subtract one from the other. And that leads to questions about, well, why is that? And is there, um, you know, something that we could go in to do on the ground, that particular place where we've got a big difference between the two, um, one way or the other. Um, and maybe that that's a really good place to make a, an investment um, going forward. Um, another thing you can do with these data sets are to do um, climate sensitivity analyses um, because you know, those response curves um, kind of describe abundance relative to you know temperature. That, that was one of the variables that, that came out as being statistically significant in these models. And you know, as we commonly see, if, if we're looking across a broad range of temperatures, um, you know those are kind of dome-shaped relationships. Um, it looks like for um, juvenile Chinook, kind of the optimal temperature are, are reaches with uh, a mean August temperature of about 15 or 16 degrees centigrade. You start to get warmer than that, um, densities start to decrease. If you start to get colder than that, densities start to increase. So depending on you know, which side of that you're on um, historically, as things warm up and go forward, you can use that to highlight um, whether Chinook densities within a particular reach might benefit from 
additional warming or um, be negatively affected by it. And so that's what that map represents um, there on the right. Um, green reaches are places where a little bit of warming might actually lead to some productivity. Red reaches are places where it, it might actually decline going forward. And because you know the, this study area happens to be in kind of a, a mountainous um, part of the country, you know, there can be a lot of thermal diversity within close proximity. Um, streams in close proximity can have very different um, trajectories going forward. And this just kind of highlights that, that you know, here are two reaches, um, one of which is projected to um, decline going forward because it's already a pretty warm place. And just next door to that, um, a stream further up in the mountains that, that's pretty cold, um, as it warms up, it, it's predicted to actually um, be beneficial to Chinook. So again, just something to be able to think about um, spatial prioritization, how things might change the future, what do they look like now, et cetera. Uh, and so with that, I think I'll probably wrap up. Um, you know, if, if people want to know more specifically about, you know, kind of what we've done with, with that larger data set application, you know, that was described um, in a BPA report um, that we did last year. Um, a lot of the geospatial data sets are associated with that are also available at the uh, StreamNet website. And I guess I would just um, stay tuned in terms of um, future discussions if you're in the Columbia River Basin about this FDAT tool, um, because we are trying to you know, kind of work through that process of figuring out a data exchange standard and, and getting um, larger buy-in to maybe make this a reality at a basin scale. So with that, I think I'll end there and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Great, great. All right. All right. I see Phil Roney raise his hand promptly. <laughs> Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you and then I'll look at the chat. Hey, thank you. Unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Hey, thanks. Great talk, Dan. Uh, um, I just a couple, well, really a couple quick questions. Um, so the, the, this looks at the average densities of fish, right? It's interpolating uh your maps of the you know it's it's kind of going on an average density have you if i understood that correctly can you do this to sort of estimate capacity so so looking at maybe a a, a higher um you know sort of using more of a quantile approach and looking at a, a higher level like the you know 80th percentile or something rather than a mean um, that, that's a good question. I'd, I'd probably have to defer to Jay on that as to whether he's implemented, you know, the quantile regression approaches in, in these or not. Um, I, I would imagine that that you could build that functionality into it, but it, it's probably not something that we have right now. Um, you know, in the absence of that, one, one of the things you could do with these data sets is, you know, you could, because there's a lot of temporal variability represented in densities from year to year, um, you, know, you could build a model that's based on just the highest historical returns we've ever seen uh, within a particular basin and use that to kind of represent the, the extreme high density sort of um, sort of situation. But um, yeah, I don't think that functionality is there yet in the software, but it's something that could be built into it. Great, thanks. All right, and I see Nancy um, is asking about the data exchange standard. Is the one you proposed or is this, is it building off existing DES in use? Are um, you proposing one or are you describing one to, that exists, I guess? I'm, uh, well, I'm proposing that we need to have one, but you know, the specifics have, have yet to be worked out. That's and right. if there, <laughs> yeah, if there are um, foundational pieces out there that are people are already familiar with using uh, if we could build off of those and not have to entirely reinvent the wheel then that that would that would be a very useful thing all right uh thanks dan i see kevin kraus right has his hand raised go ahead kevin yeah daniel thanks it's a it was a very interesting talk um i just had a question about uh some of the details on that kind of distance decay approach to the uncertainty uh, away from estimates or mm -hmm. away from sample points. And I was just curious if you could speak to that a little bit more. Did you do, was it basically like an incremental, like a certain distance away would automatically increase that uncertainty by a certain amount? And or and how did you settle on that? What was that based on? 
right? So, so spatial geostatistical models use um, something called a semivariogram just to estimate that that distance decay and similarity based on every pairwise combination of the observations that you've got. And so, you know, if you've got two observations in space, generally speaking, they're, they're going to be more similar than something that's further away. And, and the semivariogram just calculates empirically um, what that distance decay looks like. And so it's going to be unique to every data set that you feed into it. Um, and it's estimated as you go through the SSN modeling process. Um, there's something that um, we've named a Torgigram in, in honor of Christian Torgerson because he's really interested in these things. And, and that that's something that will pop up as you work through the SSN package. It'll, it'll show you actually what that distance decay is. And then, um, you know, the, the SSN model, the autoregressive part of it fits different sorts of curves to that. So you can then interpolate what the um, similarity or the um, similarity decay is depending on how far apart you are in space. Okay, great, thank you. And there is, um, you know, if you are interested in learning more about those, you, you can do a Google search on SSN and STARS website and, you know, all the software to, to uh, fit these models, lots of tutorials, lots of example data sets are all out there online and um, you, know, you can work through that. Some of those models, if you're really interested in them, or you know, as I mentioned, um, we do teach um, training workshops for those in Boise, at least during um, non-pandemic years. Yeah, let us know, Dan, at PNAMP, when you're running your next uh, set of classes there, then we'll be happy to get the word out. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions? You can raise your hand and then speak your own mind through the audio, or you could type it in. Any questions for Ryan Kinder, also our first speaker? You can entertain those now. Let's see, Ralph has one. He asks, How is the temporal variance of density across the year incorporated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that can be done different ways. Um, the way we did it in this instance was to calculate the average dent. So pull the data set together. We've got those thousands of observations. We know there's going to be a strong year effect from year to year because there's a strong year effect of, of adults coming back, reds being built, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we did that here by just estimating what the average density was for all the sites that all the surveys that were taken a particular year and then just use that average density to represent a uh, uh, interannual anomaly and so we, we could say so if we after we fit the model then we could use that parameter estimate associated with that to reconstruct what the average densities were in a particular um, historical year um, doing it that way um, it was useful and it showed up certainly as a significant variable in the model, but I think you know one potential refinement going forward is to make that um, uh, disaggregated so that maybe, you know, especially across such large areas, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of uh, variance in, in that temporal um, signal, uh, depending on which basin you're in. And so we could tie um, that temporal variability to specific index sites. If, if um, you know, a biologist told us for the Grand Ron, this particular site is our best index site and calculate that temporal variability and feed it into the model specific to that river basin and do that um, different for the Salmon Basin or the Lemhi Basin or something. If there are specific index sites, we want to tie this to and build off of that to better capture kind of that local nuance in, in density variation, um, that could be done. Thanks, Dan. We have a couple closing remarks, but I want to pause. Any more questions? You can type it in the chat. Did I miss anybody? All right. Well, Russ Granton is going to do our closeout. If you're out there, Russell. Thank you, Dan. That was an excellent talk. And Ryan, <laughs> I'm still digesting all that I learned. Here you go, Russ. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Finally, the mute has been removed. From me. <laughs> you got it. Uh, I want to thank Dan and Ryan uh, for their talks today. Really appreciate the content and discussion we had. 
And as a reminder, we can uh, see the, that information presented at PNAMP's YouTube site. We are going to have um, additional presentations on the next topic in the Emerging Technologies Information Sharing Sessions coming up in February, um, specifically focusing on data management. And as Ryan Kinzer mentioned, uh, the February 11th, um, we're going to be talking about uh, Stacy Schumacher, Schumacher and uh, Amanda Whitmire's talks. Um, but please keep posted on those sites. Uh, the, sorry, the PNAMP website will have more information for those sites and uh, for registration. Uh, uh, Amy, if you can drop in a link, there is a PNAMP monthly newsletter if you wanted to sign up and to receive the information and uh, advice for those. And the information for these presentations are again going to be posted on the ETIS site on PNAMP.org. We are also going to ask um, or actually, Amy is providing the link for the uh, webinar series survey. So for um, all those who participated today, as well as the previous four for our fish monitoring talks, um, we are providing a new link uh, for a survey for our, all of the recent surveys. Uh, please take the time to provide us feedback, including um, some input on new, new ideas or continuing ideas um, based on the presentations you have seen today. Um, as um, one part of my role here, as well as I'm a co-lead to um, or co-member uh, co of the Fish Monitoring Workgroup Planning uh, Committee, and February 11th, we are going to have a kickoff meeting of that monitoring workgroup. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, updates to coordinated assessments, DESs, and ongoing tasks that have been identified from other uh, PNAMP events. Um, including topics, and we're going to be soliciting topics for people to potentially engage and work on, including um, what Dan was just presenting, ideas on data exchange standards for snorkel surveys, and electrofishing, and fish density. Um, it can be how we do monitoring sites, um, how we share technologies or um, analytical codes for doing analysis. So the idea is to create a work group to have uh, broader discussions in the community practice here in the Northwest to continue you know, sharing the information and improving coordination of fish monitoring. And you can find that information on the PNAMP website as well for the full um, link to the uh, meeting invite and agenda. Amy, is there a uh, next slide? No, okay. <laughs> that is your last slide, Russ. <laughs> that is the <your> last slide. <laughs> Thanks everyone thanks for coming today. <laughs> everyone for coming. Thanks Russell for helping us close out. And thanks everybody for providing your feedback in the Minty polls, both to, for our speakers polls and also the one at the end. The, it's not a Minty poll, but it's a short survey to help us figure out what we should do next with this webinar series with the fish work group what topics are of interest to you and a little feedback on how we did so we can keep improving how we um, provide these kind of activities for you all thank you so much and especially to our speakers today and the great speakers we've had so far hope you come back on february 11th for the start of the data management uh, series of talks uh, Janet's February 13th and the Fish Monitoring Work Group is February 11th. Oh, thank you. I had those backwards. Yes, February Work Group. <laughs> February is a busy month for us. Thank you all.